What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the discussion in the comment section below. If this video here on a sunny Saturday gets to 1,000 likes, I will give one lucky commenter a cash prize. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit-down video today. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And over the years here on the channel, there's one thing that we've known about the mafia. As the 80s, 90s, and 2000s have played out, it's a different world than the American world of Cosa Nostra. Informants have led the way. We've talked about them here on the channel, whether it's Joe Messino, Sal Vitale, Sammy Gravano, or John A. Light. Today, though, we're going to get in to really one of the most damaging federal witnesses of all time. He has an interesting story. We've got to talk about it. The story of the one-time acting boss of the Lucchese crime family, Little Al Diarco. Next on Sit Down Shorts. Alphonse Diarco was born July 28th, 1932 in the North Brooklyn neighborhood of Williamsburg. He would grow up at 961 Kent Avenue in Brooklyn. Now, if you're familiar with this part of Brooklyn today, it is a very revitalized area full of yuppies and uh, rich folks uh, mainly. But in those days, back in the 30s, this was at the height of the Depression. And, you know, Williamsburg, North Brooklyn was essentially geographically very close to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It would attract a lot of immigrants who had hoped to work in that Navy Yard. Now, what it would also spawn in Little Al's neighborhood was uh, different gangs and, and sorts of like that. Now, in the 20s, there would be a gang that would dominate the Brooklyn Navy Yard called the Navy Street Gang. Now, by the 30s, there were really just remnants of them. They were still collecting, though, extortion in the area. For little Al Diarco, his family was actually from the southern Italian region of Salerno. And Al Diarco would, would talk very openly about the fact that in his family home, uh, it was very crowded. Um, the extended family, Al's grandparents, his aunts, uh, several uh, other extended family members would also live in the home alongside he and his parents. If you notice this home, it is a multi-story home. And essentially back in those days, a lot of families would live in these homes. They'd live on different floors. Uh, and that was just kind of a norm of uh, different ethnic uh, areas. For Al Diarco, growing up, his family, due to the fact that there were so many Alphonses, they would actually call him Sonny. Now, um, we've actually figured that out that through certain communities, they have these nicknames if you have a certain first name. And in the Italian community, it was generally Sonny. Now, Alphonse uh, Diarco's father, Joe, actually worked in the uh, fabric dye business. His grandfather, so Alphonse's grandfather, Alphonse, had a fabric dye business in Brooklyn, and they essentially uh, worked in the clothing business. Now, uh, Al Diarco would say that his father was not involved with the mafia, but really everyone back then, um, being from Italy, just kind of knew people in it. He kind of moved around the fringes, if you will, of the mafia. Um, at one point, Al Diarco would find out that his father was actually renting an area of their business to an interesting individual that was coming up in the Genovese crime family, a guy called Vincent Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo. Now, if you know anything about Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo, he comes from a long lineage and would in fact have a long lineage in the mafia and other families as well. Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo was a gigantic bookmaker and down the road would actually be integral in helping Meyer Lansky uh, create gambling in not only Cuba, but other locations uh, around even this country. So Jimmy Blue Eyes down the road would be a very famous individual in the mafia. And for a little loud, the Arca, he would kind of see the inner workings of Jimmy Blue Eyes as he grew up. Now, Al Diarco uh, would also say that at one point he did have extended family that was connected to the mafia. And we would actually find that out. And I'll talk about that in this video. But he would say as well that in other cities, even like Pittsburgh, he had uh, people that were uh, connected in the mafia and his family. But his uh, immediate family, his 
father, his grandfather, they were not uh, mob members. Now, growing up, uh, Al Diarca realized pretty quickly that he wanted to make his foray into crime. And I want to kind of discuss the old world of folks that really we don't have a lot of in our country anymore because, you know, it's just a different world we live in. But back in the 30s and 40s, ethnic areas, particularly Italy, you know, Germany, these different ethnic neighborhoods, the grandparents of these individuals would essentially tell the young kids to go into trades. You know, you don't really need to worry about school. In fact, at one point, little Al Diarco's grandmother would tell him, quote, get a job, fangul the school. Uh, so essentially, F the school. Uh, she didn't really think that it was important. Now, the problem that little Al Diarco's family had was he was a bit of a hellion. He was running the streets in his early teenage years, uh, robbing people. That was what he did, him and his friends. They would go to factories and rob people after they got their paychecks, things like that. Now, Al Diarco's family would attempt to scare him straight, you know, kind of tell him, like, this is not the life you want. But for whatever reason, even though his father and grandfather were not in that world, he saw the cars, the clothes, the jewelry, the, the women. And in that neighborhood, as we've heard time and time and time again, who the hell wants to work a regular job when all the famous and rich and successful people are gangsters? Uh, and little Al Diarco realized that pretty quick. In fact, at one point, his family would tell him, quote, if you would not stop what you're doing, you'll end up in the electric chair. Uh, they knew pretty quickly that Al Diarco probably uh, was going to not go the right way in the world. In fact, he would drop out of school at age 15. So, he decided, this is my foray. Now, he would attempt down the road to get involved with some things that were on the up and up. But before that, though, he'd begin kind of hanging around a candy store in Brooklyn. And he began hanging out with one of the proprietors of the building, an older individual called Dom Satira. Now, Satira was kind of a bit of an undesirable. In fact, he would run the candy store, but he had a little business on the side he would grab kids from the neighborhood and tip them off to robbing places and then take a piece of their action. He was a real scumbag type of guy, uh, real undesirable. He would get to know Al Diarco and, and kind of put him on to certain locations. Al would, though, go, go rob the place with his friends, and they would give this Satera a couple dollars. Ultimately, for Satera, though, he would go to prison uh, and actually give Al Diarco a job at the store, running it alongside a woman that he had running the operations. Now, this is also where Al Diarco would start to realize that gangsters ran the neighborhood. They would also do business in the back of the building. Now, by 1951, Al Diarco is in his late teens, and he's watching a TV program about the military. And he sees that his country is fighting another war. Uh, you know, a lot of his... Uh, Kids in the neighborhood are heading off to war. They're going to fight in Korea. So he gets the penchant to go into the military. And by the end of 1951, Al Diarco is a part of that world. Uh, he wouldn't actually see any battlefield time. In fact, he would actually spend a lot of time in the Arctic Circle, weirdly enough. Um, he would return to Brooklyn in late 1953. Literally, Al, Al Diarco returned to Brooklyn and would actually marry a local woman in June of 1955 called Dolores. They would ultimately have five children. Now, little Al Diarco would obviously go right back to what he knew best, criminality. He would begin stealing again, running around with a group of thieves who this at this point actually operated out of Little Italy. He began kind of a trucking route that he was involved with, a legal job, um, and started running around with these thieves that were stealing stuff, hijacking trucks, things of that nature. And a lot of their business was in and around Little Italy, which at the time was run by the Genovese crime family. Little Al Diarco would ultimately get the attention of an individual, a very uh, little-known individual, but a very powerful guy, a guy called Vincenzo Jimmy Alto Altamiri. Now, Altamiri is a bit of a ghost, quite frankly. Now, obviously, he's dead, but I mean ghost in the terms of he was a very successful member of the Genovese crime. I never got above soldier, but was very well known. In fact, the only people he was actually known to was the neighborhood. Little Al Jericho would say that he rarely got arrested, if ever. No one knew who he was. He just ran gambling in and around Mott Street, and a geographical area, which was huge money for the Genovese crime family. 
Uh, and little Al Diarco kind of was right under him. He kind of learned the game. He learned how to run craps games, uh, a game called Ziganet, which is big in the Italian community. And Diarco essentially starts running errands for uh, Jimmy Alto Altamari. Now, Altamari was also involved in something called uh, GFAR. GFAR at the time, due to the geographical location to Chinatown, GFAR was a numbers game, lottery type of system that Chinese players played. And Altamari and some of his counterparts were in control of that business as well. They were making heaps of money through dime, nickel, lottery bets. They were just killing the world to gambling. And Little Al realized that pretty quick. They would also essentially get him a union job. By 1956, Al Diarco was working in the tour workers union, which provided him a legal paycheck. As I said, he learned gambling. He learned how unions worked. And if you know anything about down the road, the Lucchese crime family and the Genovese crime family, unions are huge parts of the business. So Al is a worthy student. He's learning the game. He's understanding how things work. And by really the late 50s, he begins running craps games. He begins running Ziganet games, all for Vincenzo Altamari. Things were getting pretty good for Al Diarco. He'd eventually go to a family wedding where he would find a long lost cousin. He would meet an individual that was related to him called Joe Schiavo. Now, at the time, Joe Schiavo was a high ranking member of the Lucchese crime family. Joe Reese was an old school guy. He came up under a Salvatore Don Chirigio Curiali, one of the first people ever in the Lucchese crime family, just an old school old timer. And Joe Reese was his number two. So these connections that he's making, not only in the Genovese family, but also the Lucchese crime family were huge for little Al Diarco. By 1961, though, little Al would face his first pinch. He would be arrested for stealing a fleet uh, containing uh, coats, women's coats. Now, the Lucchese crime family ultimately kind of got him out of this uh, through some of their uh, lawyers and things like that. But Al Diarco just doesn't learn to stop stealing. He continues to steal. He continues to scam. Al Diarco would ultimately get arrested, though, again, months later for participating in a stock scam. He would admit to buying and receiving stolen property and receive two and a half to five years in state prison. He would head off to Sing Sing. For Al Diarco, though, this would prove to be, for many mobsters, and that was no different for Al Diarco. This would prove to be a very important place for Al Diarco's career. At Sing Sing, he would hang out with a bunch of other gangsters, including Salvatore Babe Vario, who was in uh, for a robbery beef. He was the brother of Paul Vario. And this would create a long lasting relationship through Babe Vario to Paul that would essentially create the career of Al Diarco. Behind the wall, Al Diarco would also tell a story of the time he you know, saw a young inmate that was struggling to find kind of his spot in prison. Not a lot of people knew this inmate real well, but Al had said he had seen him around Brooklyn and knew him from the neighborhood. He would walk up to the inmate and tell him, hey, you can start palling around with us, man. You're an Italian as well. You know, he had been on another floor, so they kind of got him transferred and into the Italian car. He would tell them that the inmate, who I'm going to say in a second, would tell him, you'll never know how much this means to me. Thank you, Al. Thank you for bringing me in. It was none other than a young Vicamuso. Now, this would be an integral relationship down the road um, for Al Diarco and for Vicamuso, but just kind of an interesting thing. And that would come from the book that Little Al would write, Mob Boss, a terrific book about Little Al's life. Upon uh, his release in 1966, Little Al would be released on parole and head back to Brooklyn. The landscape in and around New York, though, for him was different. By this point, his mentor, Vincenzo Altamari, had died. He passed away in 1964. And Little Al was really just looking for a new home. He would get a legit business, though, opening uh, a small furniture company where he was moving furniture, selling furniture. Um, he would ultimately meet an individual who would connect him with an old school character, 
Little Davy Batillo, who, if you know anything about Little Davy, he goes back to the 30s with Lucky Luciano. He had spent a long time in prison on that prostitution beef involving Lucky Luciano. By this point, Batillo is uh, an old uh, guy at this point, but he's still running a lot of operations, including a huge loan sharking book. Little Al gets uh, involved with him and starts running some loan operations for Little Davy. Now, Little Davy was also involved in the narcotics trade and Al Diarco would start getting involved with that business as well, uh, orchestrating cocaine and heroin deals. Uh, Patillo was a gangster. He'd always been a gangster and always would be a gangster. And this was another good person for Little Al to connect himself with. However, ultimately for Little Al, he realized that the furniture businesses wasn't enough. He had to involve himself in illegal operations. He had five kids by this point. He had to start producing. He had to start making more money. By the mid-70s, things are going pretty well. Al Diarco is doing stuff for Little Davy. Little Davy would ultimately get arrested, though. And for Little Al, he needed a new home. He would go back to his old friend, Babe Vario, who by this point introduces him to Pauly Vario. Now, Pauly Vario is very connected, as we know. He's a higher up in the Lucchese crime family. He has his own crew. And by the mid-70s, under the leadership of not only Joe Reese, but Paul Vario, uh, Little Al is getting close to getting his button. But Big Paul was continuing to want to make sure he could trust Little Al. He's respected. He's hanging in the crew, but he's not made just yet. Now, Little Al would tell a very interesting story uh, about uh, Tommy Simone, who, as we know, uh, was someone who didn't last very long uh, due to the fact that he was so young. But uh, Tommy Simone, who would be played by Joe Pesci in the movie uh, Goodfellas, would actually die uh, in 1979, Little Al would tell a very interesting story. That he actually saw uh, Tommy D. Simone the night he was killed. He would actually see him at Gefkin's, a bar that uh, this crew, the Vario crew, would hang around. Little Al would say that he saw uh, Tommy D. Simone get into a car with an individual called Bruno Facciola and Babe Vario. So <clears throat> that was kind of an interesting story that a little Al would ultimately have. Now, by this point, Al Diarco is making a lot of money. He's engineering drug deals. He's being trusted. Um, and at one point, uh, Paul Vario decides that he is going to test the trustworthiness of little Al. At one point, they would be at a bar. There was a guy that Vario wanted dead, a guy called Thomas Red Gilmore. Now, he would tell little Al, hey, I want you to kill this guy. They spotted him at a bar, and Vario goes, okay, go kill him. Wait till he goes outside and go kill him. He hands, according to Little Al, he hands him a knife. Little Al walks to the door to go out to kill Red Gilmore, to which Vario essentially says, hold on a second. Come back here. And Little Al claims that he tested him at this point. He didn't actually ever kill Red Gilmore. It was really, for him, just a test, I guess. Um, that point, Little Al was uh, trustworthy. He was loyal. And in August of 1982... Little Al would be made in a ceremony in Brooklyn. At the making ceremony was Paul Vario, Tom Mick Santoro, and Tony Ducks Corallo. Little Al would talk very openly that it was a very simple uh, ceremony. There were other people there, including uh, Louis Beggles Didone. He was there. He, he would be made that night as well. Little Al was finally a member of the mafia. He'd come a long way from Williamsburg. Now, he wouldn't last that long on the street. By March of 1983, little Al Diarco would be arrested for selling $31,000 worth of heroin. He would be sentenced to six years and head to USP Allenwood. He would bounce around the prison system from Allenwood to Lewisburg and then ultimately to Raybrook. He would come home in 1986. Uh, and the Lucchese crime family, as well as the mafia, was totally different. From 83 to 86, the mob changed a lot in New York. Remember, the commission crowd would happen. All the big bosses were gone. His boss, Tony Ducks, was gone. Uh, Pauly Vario was nearing indictment as well. This family was totally different. And guess who's in control of the Lucchese crime family when little Al got out? He probably couldn't believe it. The new heads of the Lucchese crime family were his old friends Vic Amuso and Anthony Cassa. Remember, 
according to Hal Diarco, in the 70s, this is the same Vic Amuso who he essentially had to bring into the fold in prison because no one knew who he was. He had made a rapid ascent to the top of the Lucchese crime family. And this would set off really kind of the demise of the Lucchese family. By this point, Little Al Diarco was one of the uh, high-end members of the Vario crew, which by this point um, was kind of a mess. Uh, obviously, Jimmy Burke was gone. Tommy DeSimone had been long killed. Uh, Paul Vario was essentially under indictment and going to prison. <clears throat> and Al Diarco would become, by 1988, the captain of the Vario crew after Vario would die in the late 80s. By this point, Little Al would be under the control of several members of the crew, including Domenico Danny Cutea, Louis Cross Bay Didone, Peter Pete the Killer Abenanti, and Frankie the Wop Manzo. Little Al was the king of the crew. And what he was also doing by this point is not only engineering drug deals, but he's earning, he's under control and leading uh, a faction of the family, and he's handling murders for the two lunatics at the top, Vic Amuso and Anthony Casso. As we know, these guys killed everyone. They had no problem doing what they had to do. Now, I want to also talk about how much money, <coughs> excuse me, Little Al Diarco is making by this point. Little Al would say that at, by this point per week, he was making 10 to 15 grand in loan interest alone a week. That's 40 grand a month in the late 80s just in loan interest. He is making a ton of money. But by 1990, the real issue that Amuso and Casso had is they were completely paranoid. They were not acting rationally. And they just started killing everyone, including citizens uh, and just people that didn't deserve to go. At some point, Little Al Diarco was contacted by Amuso and Casso and said that they need to uh, have him kill someone. They wanted Bruno Facciola dead. Now, Facciola, by this point, was making his own inroads in the family. A lot of people believed that maybe down the road, Bruno Facciola could be a boss type of guy. He was someone that was respected. People liked his abilities and people were loyal to Bruno. He had his own little crew inside the Vario group. And Casso and Amuso essentially tell Diarco that Facciola is an informant. Now, I want to make it clear, there is no evidence to today that Bruno Facciola was a witness uh, or a rat at any level. Uh, but as a good mobster, Little Al Diarco orchestrates the murder. He would order family hitman Frank Lastarino and one of his crew members, Louis Cross Bay de Don, to take out Bruno Facciola. They would kill him at a warehouse in Brooklyn. As I said, there is no known knowledge that Bruno Facciola was a rat. These two lunatics were not acting rationally. And by this point, little Al decides that for the family, he's not going to kill anyone anymore. At one point, he's asked to kill fat Peter Chiotto. That fails. And he is demoted. Casso and Amusa say, little Al, you're not the boss anymore. You're still a high-ranking member, but we're going to put a board up, a four-man group, to run this family. And little Al realizes that his stock in the family is lowering because these two guys are not rationally acting. They're not acting normal. They're paranoid. They're on the run. They're killing people for no reason. Um, little Al in mid-July of 1991 is – back to being just a capo. He's not the acting boss anymore. He's summoned to a meeting in September of 1991 at the Kimberly Hotel in Manhattan. Now, this meeting was essentially to kind of talk about family business. In the middle of the meeting, an individual who was at that meeting, a lower end guy by this point, Michael DeSantis, uh, pops up. And according to Diarco, he saw that Mr. DeSantis had a gun, which was not normal. You don't go to sit downs with guns. Now, DeSantis was also wearing, according to Diarco, a bulletproof vest. DeSantis says that he needs to go to the bathroom. And when he comes back, Diarco notices that the gun is gone. 
Now, Diarco, in all his time as a member of the mafia, realizes this is not good for me. The next person that comes out of that bathroom is going to kill me. So Diarco realizes that he's not just shelved or moving on and being demoted. He is out of favor with the Muso and Castle, and that's not where you want to be. Diarco hightails it out of the Kimberly Hotel and you know, gets to a car and, and, and flees. The next day, little Al Diarco saw the writing on the wall. He would contact an agent in the FBI called Bob Marston and decide that he wanted to become a member of Team USA. At that time in 1991, little Al Diarco would be the highest person rank-wise in the mafia to ever testify. Now, Bob Marston would say that at one point he would call his superior and they didn't believe that Little Al was in with the the FBI. It was really just a 24-hour thing. Little Al saw the writing on the wall. Fat Pete was shot at. Uh, these guys were going off cold cocked. This was the end for Al. He had no other choice. It was stay on the street and get killed or become an informant. And that's exactly what he decided to do. Little Al would debrief everything he would talk about people including sonny franzese tough tony federici steven crea vicka musso jimmy ida a genovese consigliere anthony casso he would even talk and this is a very interesting story little al diarco in his book mob boss would tell a story that he debriefed the fbi that at one point an actor burt young who played Pauly in Rocky, started hanging around Lucchese guys. He was a friend of Vic Amusa. At one point, Diarco would say that Burt Young actually asked little Al and Amuso if he could become a member of the Lucchese crime family. He was so enamored by the mafia, to which Amuso would tell him, quote, stick to acting. This life ain't for you. Uh, so little Al spilled his guts on everything. And he would be really one of the more destructive federal witnesses of all time. When it was all said and done, little Al Diarco would testify in 12 different trials, including the trial for Bonanno heavyweight Anthony Spiro, the mafia cops Stephen Caracapa and Lou Epolito, Vincent the Chin Giganti, little Vic Arena in the Colombo crime family, and others. All of these individuals, for the most part, would get life sentences, including the Mafia cops, Vincent Giganti, and Anthony Spiro. He was an incredibly destructive witness, and he was also a very destructive witness to Anthony Casso and Vic Amuso. As we know, Anthony Casso would decide that the mm -hmm. info against him was so deep that he would cooperate himself. Now, today, to this day, to this hour, to this minute, Little Vic Amuso sits in federal prison. Think about that. This is the early 90s. Vic Amuso is still paying for these crimes. He sits in a federal prison at 88 years old. Little Al Diarco would tour the country. He was in the witness protection program and essentially would live out his life in relative anonymity. He would never break the law again. And would die in 2019 at the age of 86. When we look back on mob informants, right, we essentially only today talk about the ones we see on YouTube. Guys like Gravano and A-Light and Calandra and Mikey Scars, who were all very interesting people. We obviously talk about Mikey Scars and Gravano. They were high-end people. They were very destructive witnesses. I've talked about Sal Vitale, very destructive when we look back, Little Al was, until Messino, the highest person to ever testify against the mafia. He was the acting boss of the Lucchese crime family. Decided to flip. Put a ton of people away. Very destructive individual. I'll leave you with a quote from Al Diarco. He would say in his book, quote, I could go back to crime now if I wanted to. Crime is crime. You don't forget how to make a living. But I won't go back to it because I got Dolores, my wife. I have my family. My life ain't that important when it comes to them. 
in his book, he would say he it would say he shook his head and slapped the baseball cap against his knee. Quote, when I tell the FBI that I'm through with crime, I'm through with crime. If I'm starving, I won't go back to it. I gave my word. I still dream about that life. Guys chasing me. I'm chasing them. Maybe they'll get me yet. They didn't get to him. And Al Diarco would die in his own bed in old age. In the end, Al Diarco won. It's an interesting life full of crazy turns. Al Diarco started as a thief on the street in Williamsburg way back in the 40s. He would be around the likes of little Davy Batillo. You know, Joe Rischiavo, Tony Ducks, Paul Vario. Fascinating individual. I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure before you go, you hit that like button so we can get to a thousand likes and I can give someone a cash prize. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you next week here on The Sit Down. <laughs>